Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Thank you for listening. I'm in the ReliefFactor.com studio. So pleased to welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Show, Senator Susan Collins of the great state of Maine. Senator Collins, good morning. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much, Hugh. I'm delighted to be on your show. I think you've got the best campaign website. I think it's because Mainers look good in red, but it's SusanCollins.com, <laughs> but it, it really is. Have you always used the red motif for your campaigns? I have since 1994 when I first ran for governor. So uh, it, it has actually a funny story to it. I had three red outfits in my closet, very few clothes at the time uh, that were appropriate for campaigning. So my mother suggested that I use the color red. <laughs> oh, good choice, Mom. Well, it's a great campaign website. It's SusanCollins.com. I want every Republican to go there and get behind the senator. And independents, we're on in Maine, we're on in Portland, and Democrats. I think Susan Collins has won handily for years. Your, co- your seatmate, Angus King, is a friend of the program because he's friends with George and Fran, who you also know up in Freeport. So he comes on and we spark it up a little bit, but you and I are going to agree. And if you don't mind, I'd like to start with defense, Senator Collins, because you're on the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, if I'm correct. Am I right about that? You are. <clears throat> You've got the bath ironwork. And George took me there when my son got married in Freeport last summer. And I saw the Zoom Walt, the last of the Zoom Waltz. I think it's the Lyndon Johnson going out. We need to keep destroyers coming out of the Bath Ironworks. Do you, is there a plan to do that? Because we need those ships. You're absolutely right. And when you look at the tensions in the Straits of the Moose, it becomes very obvious why we need to have a strong Navy. Uh, The Navy has put out a plan to have an increase in the number of ships in our fleet. And I'm very proud of the role that Bath Ironworks plays in building the best destroyers in the world and making sure that our Navy is strong. The Navy allows us to project power and to have presence in areas of the world uh, where otherwise we would be denied access. And it also, and we're seeing this with Iran now, is absolutely critical in helping to keep open shipping lanes to international commerce. Do you so think the, Do you think that Bath could do three destroyers a year? Sometimes they do two, but do you think Bath can handle three? And is that something that defense appropriations gets down into? That's not an earmark. That's a defense priority. That's right. And Bath used to regularly build three destroyers a year. And that is the number that we need in order to, to come out of Bath Ironworks in order to make sure uh, that we're meeting the goals that the Navy has for the fleet. It also helps to sustain a very talented workforce, which is important for our industrial base. We want to make sure uh, that we have the skilled craftsmen and women in this country, engineers and others, who can make sure that uh, if we need to ramp up, that we have the ability to do so. So that is really important as well. But three, three is perfect for Bath to produce in a year. I hope they, I hope you put that into the NDAA and into the defense of probes. Let me turn to the news yesterday. Navy secretary, Richard Spencer and the president announced that they were reaching down in the ranks for a new chief of Naval operations to vice Admiral Michael Gilday. Now, everything I've read about him, including Admiral Stavridis on this show yesterday tells me he's a genius and he's a real forward thinking, but it's a big, it's a big reach deep into the ranks. What did you make of that move? And have you, have you talked to Secretary Spencer about it, Senator Collins? I have not yet talked to the secretary about it, although I do talk with him often and he is a terrific secretary of the Navy, by the way. Um, it, what has happened, and it's really been unfortunate is there was a procurement scandal that unfortunately took out several people from contention. Not unfortunately, that would they deserve to not be in contention for chief of naval operations. Uh, the individual who is there now, Admiral Richardson, who is a native of the great state of Maine, is retiring. And I believe that the secretary was right to reach down into the ranks because there have been some problems 
in the top ranks of the Navy in recent years. I have great confidence in Secretary Spencer's judgment, and I believe he's made a good choice. Now, let me switch to your other committee. You've got a lot of committees. You're on Intel and Aging, but I want to go to Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions for a second. This is a topic I've discussed with your colleague, Senator Grassley and Senator Alexander, and it's about pension reform. You've got an, an aging population of men. I believe you demographically are older than the mean in the United States, and a lot of older Americans face terrible choices, leave their house or use their retirement, have to take their retirement out of tax-protected status to pay their mortgage. Isn't there some way, Senator Collins, of, of, I'm thinking particularly of some people who used to live across from George and Fran when they lived at Thanksgiving Farm, a couple of old sisters who had an old farm. Isn't there some way to allow senior citizens to use their protected savings without triggering a tax event to stay in their houses? There certainly should be. And we are looking at the whole issue of retirement security. Maine is the oldest state by median age in the entire country. Wow. So this is a real problem. And we have a large percentage of our seniors who are living on nothing but their Social Security. And the average Social Security benefit is only $16,000 a year. So that is not enough for a comfortable retirement. I think we've seen a sea change in how people... Um, live in their retirement years. I I think of it as a three-legged stool. You used to have fixed pensions adjusted for for inflation that came from your employer. Now those have gone by the wayside, except in the public sector for the most part. And there are 401k programs, which are great, but they are often not available for people who work for small businesses. So one of the bills that I've introduced, which I think would help a lot, is to encourage more small businesses to band together and to offer 401k plans or other kinds of retirement plans and give them tax incentives to match contributions of their employees. The second tool is Social Security. We know that the finances of Social Security are shaky, such as When we look out to the year just 2035, Social Security is not going to have sufficient funds to pay the benefits that are due. And the third leg is private savings, and our rate of savings is abysmally low in this country. So we've got to be creative. We've got to look at um, allowing people to use the equity in their homes, but also uh, we've got to encourage them to save more during their working years and small businesses to have the means to be able to um, put up retirement plans without facing enormous costs and complexity. Check, check, check. And then one idea I'd place in your ear to think about, if a senior citizen has got $100,000 in a protected IRA and a $100,000 mortgage, it just seems to me they ought to be able to use the former to pay off the latter without a taxable event. And I know that some people say, oh, that will lose too much money. You'll get it back when the house sells eventually, but then they can stay in their house without giving half of their money to Uncle Sam. I just, I think it's the most obvious thing in the world. I think it's a great idea. Let me move, if I can, then, to um, uh, the new book, Justice on Trial. Have you had a chance to read the new Molly Hemingway, Carrie Servino book yet? Severino? I've ordered it. I've ordered it, and it's arriving today. I've read some excerpts, and, uh, but I get it today. It's a terrific <laughs> book, and, and you play a large role in it because you played a large role in the Kavanaugh hearings. First of all, I want to thank you for, not for what you said, I, I appreciated the way you voted, but for focusing the attention on the United States Senate on on a speech in a way I have not seen in my 30 years of broadcasting. I don't actually think anyone has focused the attention of the country on a Senate speech in the way that you did. Were you aware of the audience that day? I really wasn't. I was concentrating on trying to lay out as clearly and as comprehensively as possible, how I got to my decision. It was only later that I realized um, how many people watched or listened to the speech because I kept getting stopped by people, no matter where I was, who told me, 
that they pulled over in their car to listen or stopped and gathered with they lived on the west coast that they gathered in uh, their corporate lunchroom or their workplace and uh, so then I realized that it had a broader audience than I had thought at the time. I, I compared it to, because I'm from Cleveland, the LeBron's decision show that disappointed me at the end. But this was a show where a speech where I had no idea what you were going to say. And so you held the audience and it was a great lesson to senators going forward. My question is, the next time around. Would you like the president to consult with you before he makes a nomination? And I assume he did not do so before this time around. What do you think about that process? Well, the Constitution is very, very clear when it says advise and consent. So uh, the president, the night uh, shortly after Justice Kennedy announced his decision, did invite Joe Manchin, Lisa Murkowski, and me uh, to come over to the White House and talk with him. But uh, it really wasn't uh, a discussion of, of whom he should look at. My advice to him was that he should broaden his list and that if there are individuals that come to his attention whom he believes would be good federal judges, he should not feel constrained by the list that he released during the campaign. I know that there are many people who are very pleased that he released the list, but I don't think he should feel that he can't go beyond that list. And indeed, uh, Justice Kavanaugh was not on the original list. So, I think um, I think that presidents should do more on advice and consent in general. Uh, it's not just President Trump, but uh, President Obama as well. There hasn't been a lot of outreach to Congress before to the Senate, rather, before the nomination is made. Now, I was unaware of or had forgotten the meeting that you had with the president. How long did you and Senators Manchin and Murkowski talk with the president on that night? It was probably about 20 minutes, um, I would say. Senator Manchin's uh, meeting was after hours. Uh, Senator Murkowski and I were on the Senate floor and we each had gotten messages from our staff that the White House wanted us to go over and meet with the president. So we decided we would go jointly. And actually, when I think about it now, I think that our original meetings were supposed to be 20 minutes each. And we realized that if we combined our meeting, we would get more time oh, with the president. Did, uh, did either the name Kavanaugh or Kethledge or Hardiman come up? Did any specific names come up that evening? It was more of a general conversation. It, uh, I don't recall a lot of discussions of specific individuals. I do not recall uh, Justice Kavanaugh's name coming up that evening, no. All right, now let me turn, in my last question, we're short on time, to the 44 circuit judges the president is nominated and the Senate is confirmed, or I think it's 42 with two pending. That's a great record, but I note with alarm that only one out of four are women. And I believe this will haunt the president in his reelection campaign, especially if he's up against your colleague, Senator Harris. Have you discussed this with the administration that, I mean, there are plenty of qualified women to be circuit court judges in the United States. And this imbalance, I think, is not reflective of the country's bar and it is a political risk. What do you think, Senator Collins? I totally agree with you. I think that the president does need to um, seek out more qualified women who are, of which there are a great number, who would be willing to serve on the courts. And uh, that is an area where I have noted that because I've, uh, I haven't discussed it personally with the president, but I have noted that and uh, talked to others about it. And I would like to see um, more women appointed to the court, nominated to the courts. Um, it's important because we want the courts to be more representative of America. And 
there are outstanding women, and some have been chosen. For example, I'm I'm thinking of Joan Larson, yes. who was a, on the Supreme Court of Michigan, and um, I think uh, she's outstanding, and she was nominated to the federal court. Um, who knows? Maybe she's a potential future Supreme Court nominee. I, I haven't followed her record that closely since voting for her confirmation for the appellate court, uh, but I think she's an outstanding candidate. Well, or, so, there are I'm many sorry, others. I think and she's on the Supreme Court. We're short yeah, on time. Very quickly, are you? We got less than a minute. Are you confident about reelection? I never take any reelection for granted, but I have been uh, boosted by the strong support that I'm seeing as I go around the state of Maine. But there's no doubt that I am a top target of the Democrats, uh, largely for casting votes that I believed in. And uh, it's ironic because there's no one who works more across the aisle than I do. Um, and yet I am uh, the number one or number two target of, of Chuck Schumer. I think people need to go to SusanCollins.com and fight back against that. And it was a brave and courageous moment on Judge Kavanaugh, but also on all these things you've worked on and with Bath, the Ironworks and the Navy. Thank you, Senator Collins. Come back during the year. Thanks so much, Hugh.